Okay. Welcome to the Rational Egoist. I'm your host, Michael Leibowitz. Many years ago, when I was still incarcerated, I read a book called Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky, if I'm pronouncing the, the Russian name right. Anyway, I was captivated by the book. I thought his description of the criminal Raskolnikov was very reminiscent of the people that I was around and of myself. And I went on to read a few books by Dostoevsky, in, in, uh, in Notes from Underground, House of the Dead, The Brothers Karamazov. And I find it he, he is a very, very good writer. So I decided to have somebody on that could talk to us a little about him. So we've got today a professor of the practice of Slavic and Eurasian studies, and she's a specialist in, among other subjects, Russian literature, Carol Apollonio. Professor Carol Apollonio, welcome to the program. I hope I pronounced the name correctly. Thank you very much, Michael. Well done. <laughs> okay, and excellent. I, uh, we're going to have a lot to talk about. I can feel it already. So Dostoevsky, where was he born and what was his early life like? Okay. Uh, he's he's a Russian guy. I'm, this is no surprise to anybody, right? Um, and we just, when I say we, I mean we Dostoevskians in the business just celebrated his bicentennial which oh, wow. you know, 200 years since his birth. So that's how you can remember it. It was 2021. So that was 1821. He was born. He lived 60 years. So it's a very nice little bookended life within the 19th century, right? 20 years in, as soon as he's born, he lives 60 years and then he dies and then 20 years and pretty soon the whole country falls apart. So that's his years. He was a lower, um, his, he was a member of the nobility, but very lower nobility. They never had, you know, a lot of money. He had no money. He was, uh, and he wrote he wrote for money, you know, so that was important in that day and age, because if you were a member of the nobility, like someone like Leo Tolstoy, who was a count, you know, and he wrote War and Peace. So he 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 was a good author, but he had no problem with money. You know, he Dostoevsky was a professional writer who who wrote these books to sell them. And so some of what you read you can feel that he wants to get you interested. You know, he's got a lot of sensationalism in there. He's got people screaming and running. And of course, as you mentioned crime and punishment, lots of violent crime. Um, and a lot of it, I mean, he feels strongly about these issues, of course, but some of it also is to attract readers, you know, um, who were used to, to reading works that were a little bit by better behaved people. And, and by the way, meaning people had better manners, you know, and wrote about discreet and, you know, polite things. And Dostoevsky himself uh, spent four years in hard labor prison uh, for a political crime, basically. And we don't we don't need to get into the details there. But the point was that in 1849, which if you know a little bit of history, Europe was going through revolutions at this time, socialist revolutions. So it was a very sort of antsy time, you know, if you're a person in power like the Soviet or the Russian uh, emperor, let's say, or Tsar. So everybody's very anxious about free thinking. And Dostoevsky was arrested for sort of free, free thinking and was sent to Siberian labor camp for four years. And then he was exiled for four years after that. And so it's after that experience, which was through the 1850s, he comes back in 1860, basically, and he starts writing these amazing novels, all of them about crime. Now, you read Notes from Underground, which everybody in the, in the planet should read. It's a crazy book, really important, very profound um, but it's not a novel. The big novels he wrote, all of them were about a violent crime, you know, so it, it was something that he thought about a lot while he himself was imprisoned with, incarcerated with, not all of them political prisoners, very few of them actually, most of them just, you know, people who were criminal criminals. Um, yeah. So he became interested in literature at a young age. What was uh -huh. the attraction for him? Why did he get involved in literature uh -huh. it's a, such a great point um you know there's so many different ways to answer these kinds of questions right because i would say for one thing back in the 19th century and in russia they didn't have the v the media that we have you know there's absolutely nothing really i mean it was the main re, re the main way to communicate was through the written word unlike now like where you have podcasts <laughs> you know, and social media and TV and, you know, basically communication is instantaneous. And we sort of forget that there was a time when the the most important communication had to take place through the written word. So 
a subset of that is fiction and literature, but in Russia, which was an oppressive country and people's, people were limited in their ability to express their true thoughts, which might've been revolutionary, um, some of these revolutionary thoughts, let's say, were expressed in what looked to be fiction, right? So that the fiction carried these hidden messages that were revolutionary. So fiction was very important in those days. And I think for Dostoevsky, um, you know, he, he, he himself had socialist thoughts when he was young. He totally renounced them when he got older. And that becomes a big story that will go into the weeds and we don't want to be in the weeds. Um, <laughs> so, um, but there's also, you know, psychological reason. I mean, who becomes a writer? It's not a fun thing to do, you know? Um, but some people are just inclined to, to, to the written word, you know, as a form of expression. Some people are inclined to express themselves through music, let's say, or art. It happens that a, a small set of people are very good at expressing themselves in, in words. And Dostoevsky was one of those. He was he was someone who wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote. So it, that's a very interesting question that nobody can answer, but it's a combination of you know the, the time and place he lived in, the fact that literature was valued a great deal by people during that time, because you couldn't trust what the government was writing, let's say. You know, it was just very limited. So um we still can't trust what the government writes, can we? <laughs> I'm not going to speak on contemporary matters. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's fine. That's fine. So at yeah. some point, uh, he develops a gambling addiction. So oh, yeah. what were what were some of the experiences he had as a gambling addict in, I guess it would have to be near mid-century Russia? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, here, there's it's such an interesting um, question, right? Because gambling is, for some people, an addiction, you know, for and for some people, just a thing they do. For Dostoevsky, it was an addiction. But one thing very interesting was that um, Dostoevsky went to Western Europe, mostly Germany, let's say, and also Switzerland and France and so on. And his, his gambling problem only showed up in the West, only showed up in Western Europe, which is quite interesting because Dostoevsky had, he was a Russian patriot on the one hand, you know, so he was a believer in Russian values and whatever that entailed. But when he went abroad, that was when he succumbed to this gambling addiction. And it went on uh, for several years, um, and and until uh, one day, you know, it stopped after he married his second wife, and it becomes sort of a nuanced discussion. But he wrote the best way to learn about Dostoevsky's gambling is to read his book called *The Gambler*. Very convenient. You don't have to even like try and write it down. It's like, yeah, he was a gambler. He wrote a book called *The Gambler*, um, which itself is is super interesting everything in his life was fascinating he he you know this thing about the, the the before he went to prison remind me to come back to gambling by the way but before he went to prison um he was sentenced to death literally for this political crime along with several other people and he, he was told they were they were brought out onto the central square of saint petersburg on a freezing day at the end of december it was like christmas time with these prisoners um and they were they were taken out to the central square of snow and freezing and they were read this death sentence they did not know they were going to be sentenced to death and they look up and there's this you know a, a sort of a scaffold where they were going to take them and, and actually a firing squad was there with guns and everything so he's like okay i've got one minute to live this, this really happened and at the very last minute it's like in a novel you know a courier gallops up from the tsar with a reprieve okay we're not going to kill you guys after all. We're going to send you to Siberian prison. And everybody's, thank you by the great mercy of, you know, the Tsar. We're going to live. Um, of course, it, it was a traumatic, absolutely dramatic experience. Dostoevsky's life was full of these kinds of things. And so he goes, not, I, I would say that was the, the main one. But when he went to Europe, he was also a, a gambler and experienced, you know, he, he, he would lose all his money. He would pawn his wife's clothes, you know, and so on. She'd be in the hotel room waiting for him to, you know, win some money back. And so this was part of his life for, for several years, really. Um, and, and basically, some of these experiences then obviously serve as very good material for, for literature, right? In his book, The Brothers Karamazov, there is a story written, I think it was by Ivan Karamazov, called yeah. The Grand Inquisitor. Mm -hmm. Brilliant story in its own right, you know, very uh, religious. But 
what I'm wondering is what role did religion play in Dostoevsky's life? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Such great, great questions. By the way, I just want to say that currently right now I'm teaching a class on that book, a whole class. Oh, wow. The book. So so I, I'm going to tell my students about this and maybe they'll, they'll listen to you. <laughs> oh, but, I hope so. That'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. And it's such a famous part of that book. So I'm glad you're bringing it up. Um, we actually started our class by reading it. It's it's from the middle of the novel, but we start the class with it because it's so often, for example, taught in philosophy classes or in religion classes. Religion was just so important to Dostoevsky, obviously. You can sort of feel it in that text, but at the same time in The Grand Inquisitor, um, he, he's also presenting a very eloquent character. The Grand Inquisitor, for example, you know, is this character created by Ivan Karamazov, one of the three brothers in the book. Ivan is the intellectual, he's thoughtful, and he's just not going to take faith for granted. You know, he's going to, he, he needs to think it through and find reasons for there to be a God, let's say, or for me to believe in, in the Christian faith. And so this text is something that, that Ivan Karamazov wrote, let's say, and he sort of recites it in the middle of the book to his brother, Alyosha. And Alyosha, just to, for the curious, is the religious guy, right? So you got the atheist and the religious brothers having this conversation at the center of the book. And, and since you've read it, you know that Alyosha doesn't talk at all, right? He just sits there and listens. And um, that is part of what Dostoevsky is trying to do with religion, I think. He himself wrote very eloquently about faith and religion, but he's not calling it something necessarily easy, right? Um, and so the Grand Inquisitor voices that rational approach to religion. It's like, I'm not, I'm not gonna believe in God because my logic doesn't tell me that God exists, right? This is part of it. Um, and Alyosha can't really answer him, right? logically he can't say oh no but you forgot this or that logical thing no i mean it's a very strong case you know people suffer in the world that's what ivan says he says if god is allowing people to suffer why should i believe in him right how can i you know i want people not to suffer it's called theodicy you know the philosophers call this a uh, type of a text that challenges um a world that in which god allows suffering that's what a theodicy is. And the whole novel is like that. It's like, how can you justify faith in God when particularly children are suffering? So when you read the whole novel, you'll see examples of how Dostoevsky develops this problem. The real challenge for people, and it's why this text is so difficult, is you're going, okay, well, that was really eloquent. <laughs> you know, uh, that's really persuasive, you know. So what's a counter argument? And the counter argument is like not possible to communicate in logic, logical terms. And in the novel itself, um, Dostoevsky presents throughout the whole novel this dynamic. Um, and there's a temptation. I don't know how far into the weeds you want to get here, but wherever you think it needs to go. Okay, you stop me when it gets crazy or boring, right? So there, the Gospel of of Matthew um, is is a text that that Dostoevsky quotes in the book. Um, the devil, Christ goes into the wilderness, and and of course Christ is experiencing the, these these moments before he comes back into civilization and and is treated as the Messiah, right? It's sort of like a test. So Christ goes into the wilderness. He spends forty days as part of the Bible. And while he's out and he, he's eating locusts, you know, he's fasting and living an ascetic life and avoiding all the temptations of the, of the flesh. And in, in, the, in the desert, then the devil comes to him, comes and talks to him. And he says, hey, you know, prove you're the son of God. You're the son of God, just prove it. It'll be easy. Everybody will believe you. And you can do this in three ways. He gives him three challenges. One is he says, well, everybody's hungry. So why don't you take these stones and turn them into bread? This very famous. And Christ then answers, he says, man does not live by bread alone, right? And Dostoevsky uses that first miracle, that Christ has rejected the opportunity to prove his existence through miracle and feeding people. The second miracle is the devil says, you want to prove that you're immortal? I can't remember if it's the second or third, frankly. <laughs> prove that you're immortal. So says the devil. The devil is 
the one who's challenging crisis, jump down from this high roof and when you don't die, everybody will know you're immortal because it's a miracle. Both of these things are miracles, right? And uh, then there's move this mountain, you know, or uh, I'm blanking right now, but there, but but the three impossible miracles that Christ is given the opportunity to perform and he refuses, right? Yeah, this so is where said, Jesus tells him, right? It, uh, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test or, or some yeah. such thing. So it, yeah. it seems that Dostoevsky's answer isn't a rational one when it comes to the existence of God. It's yeah. a faith-based yeah, exactly uh, right. argument where he's basically saying that if you're going to believe, you have to do so by faith because there's yeah. no logical way to arrive yeah. at that. And that's yeah. fine with, with Dostoevsky. Yeah. Is it fine with your basic reader? You know, it's a, it's a, it's a challenge. And I think, and I mean, if, if there were to be sort of one little way of summarizing the novel's arguments, you just did, you know, and I think your listeners ought to back up, you know, whatever they do, like push the re rewind button, <laughs> and just write that down because that, that is the point, you know, there's an opposition between rationality and logic and proof and empiricism and science and all that on the one hand, which is extremely convincing to us, obviously, you know, and then there's this little thing where Alyosha is sitting there quietly and going, yeah, but, you know, none of that stuff is going to, you can't prove that God exists. You know, as you said, do not test. You said it really. You see, yeah. Jesus said, you, it's written, you should not put the Lord your God to the test. Something along those yeah, exactly lines, right. probably exactly. depending on the translation. Yeah. So then what happens is that's a little piece of the novel, but it really is dominates the whole novel in terms of that question. Faith versus proof faith versus proof so then we have a crime and you know not to give away what happens to your to your listeners obviously but there's a vicious crime a, a brutal murder that occurs at the center of the novel and so the question then becomes um a crime novel and a courtroom drama and um, a, a thing about justice right and the idea is an innocent man is accused of murder but you cannot he cannot be proven innocent right through through evidence and logic because all the evidence is actually against him dostoevsky sets this up very very carefully so ultimately and I, again my students are listening maybe so i don't want to give away the, <laughs> but, but the the outcome of a court case you know is is sort of a way in which dostoevsky is also saying okay earthly justice does one thing in other words, a man might be convicted, an innocent man might be convicted, right? But God's justice or Christ's justice, that's a different thing. Right. And you cannot prove it. So, you know, it cannot be proven in a court of law. It's just total faith. And it's, it's one of the ways it's put in, 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 say, Russian culture is the opposition between law and grace. So, right? So your, your basic legal justice system, and I imagine your listeners have strong feelings about it as we all do, right? Is it always true that a, a legal case or, or a, you know, a person ac accused of a crime, is it always true that the court of law comes up with the perfect just decision in that case, right? Well, a lot well, of people- No, and it, it sounds like from what you're saying that Dostoevsky had this sort of view. It's an argument I frequently hear from mm -hmm. theists. They'll say, well, this world is unjust. And, you know, so if you want to have justice, we have to have a, a God figure so that in the afterlife, there'll be punishments and rewards doled out. Of course, that doesn't prove anything. It just, that, that's just a, a, a wish. But I mm -hmm. suppose if you're willing to rely on faith, as Dostoevsky obviously is, then to have a wish like that is fine. Yeah. But the, the crime element, I kind of want to back up a little bit to his mm -hmm. time in prison. Mm -hmm. um, he writes the book, uh, The House of the Dead, uh, or, or a narrative of the house and the dead, some such thing as that. I, yeah. The copy yeah. I had was just called The House of the Dead. Yeah. But I know it's part autobi autobiographical. Yes. So, And I got to tell you, his description of the way that the prisoners were in Russia in the 1800s mm -hmm. was very comparable to my own experience in prison in the 21st century. Really? It was it, it it was very fascinating because, uh, for instance, in my you know I read this book almost 20 years ago, but I if I'm remembering correctly, he was talking about things like you have to watch what you say because they'll repeat it, they'll go to the guards, that sort of thing. 
And I used to laugh because guys in prison would say, you know, 15, 20 years ago, guys weren't going to the guards and, and, and you know, snitching, they call it. Mm-hmm. And I would laugh and say, this stuff is as old as time. It's nothing yeah. new. Yeah. But my, my question, I guess, is how much of the House of, of the Dead was autobiographical? And then I wonder how much that impacted his religious faith, if at all, spending mm-hmm. time, you know, and being incarcerated. Yeah. I just want you to know that I want to listen to you <laughs> right now. I want you to tell me more because um, these are just great sort of themes that you're bringing up and points. Um, the the notes from the House of the Dead or memoirs from the House of the Dead or House of the Dead is is an extraordinary book, as as you as you felt I guess when you read it. Uh, nobody had ever written about experience in prison before ever. He was the first one to write. It, it, one of the reasons is because. He was literate, you know, he could read and write. And most of these prisoners were not. And they didn't. And he was a writer, so he had contacts and he could publish it when he got back. So um, it's quite real. It's quite real and autobiographical, the, these experiences. And he's writing from his own observations. The problem is, if if he presented it um, in St. Petersburg, Russia, where he was, where it was published, if he presented it as factual, never would have gotten published because it showed you the, the insides of a, of a Imperial Russian prison, right? And so he had to pretend, you know, he had to pretend that it was all fiction. His readers knew, these are not, these are smart people, these readers. They're like, oh yeah, we know, but we'll just pretend that it's a, a novel, you know, it's a fiction. Um, and so pretty much what you read in there was experienced by him. Um, and you, you mentioned snitching. Um, there's a character in there that you may remember. Is it, and it depends on your translation, but it's it, his. he's not named, probably. He might be called Arista with an A, or it might be an A with a hyphen. So this Arista was a nobleman who'd been in prison, but he was the lowest of the low. He was the, the, the scum of the earth, basically. And the reason was because he was an informer, right? Uh, and so Dostoevsky, who it was quite, it was his, his own personal story, um, emphasizes this problem of informing being the worst and the lowest of, of things that a human being can do, kind of like in Dante, you know, when you when you go to hell, again, I'm not a Dante expert, but the darkest circle of hell is for the traitors, you know, people who who betray you. So it's, it's a serious thing. And Dostoevsky was arrested for, you know, comp- conspiracy and so on. He had, there were 13 other people sentenced to death with him. They had met every Friday and they talked, you know, revolutionary ideas and they were all put in solitary confinement and interrogated repeatedly for several months. And he, nobody betrayed anybody else. Dostoevsky didn't betray anyone despite this treatment. So it was a very, very deeply, deeply held conviction just at the very visceral and basic level of his, of his entire ethical, you know, being, but you don't do that, you know. You don't snitch, right? <laughs> so this guy turns out to be the most evil guy in the prison, but he's a nobleman, you know, he's not a peasant. So um, one of the other things Dostoevsky tried to do in the prison, and we've actually talked about it a bit with my students, and so it's fresh in my mind, and tell me, just stop me if I get off track for that oh. reason. But this was a nobleman, he was an educated man, he was, a, everybody knew his name, he was quite famous. And he's out in Omsk, <laughs> the middle of Siberia, a place that I visited. Um, I have a blog that I that I wrote about, um, you know, my travels through Siberia following Russian writers, and one of them, of course, Dostoevsky. So I visited the site of his prison. And um, so, uh, where was I going to go with that? Uh, so Dostoevsky in prison. He's from. He's urban. He's intellectually smart, um, intelligent. Uh, and when I say intelligent, I mean someone who's educated doesn't mean he's smarter than anybody else. It just means he had an education, right? He gets thrown in the middle of the mass of of people who are not like that. You know, they're not literate. These are common criminals, you know, violent criminals. He's an intellectual criminal, right? And so it's the the not the story itself, House of the Dead, is is really the the big the big narrative of it is how this man struggles with himself to appreciate the common people, the peasants of Russia who were so otherwise divided from the elites. Uh, you know, we live in a time of the 1%. I don't think I'm spreading any news about that. But um, there was a similar situation in Russia then. You know, there was elite, there were nobility, they had 
property, they could own, you know, land and so on. And then the vast masses of people were poor peasants, you know, they couldn't own property, they were not educated. And so this guy is in the middle of them and he's trying to learn from them. And that's that's the big story of House of the Dead, I think. And it's one of the reasons why I just think it's one of the best things ever written. If you ask Leo Tolstoy, our war and peace guy, he'll say the same thing. He thinks that war, this, this particular book by Dostoevsky is one of the greatest things ever written because of this profound effort on this man's part to understand the common people, you know, and to somehow love them despite the fact that they're beating each other up and they're drinking all the time and, you know, swearing and, and just behaving in a way that he'd never really been exposed to, right? It's an incredible book, and I'm glad you brought it up. So it brings me to Crime and Punishment. Now, Dostoevsky is a master psychologist, both in the uh, depth of his descriptions and their accuracy. As he takes us through the thought processes of Raskolnikov and the planning the crime and trying to get away for, with the crime, the you know panic attacks he's going through, everything is just phenomenal. And yeah. very accurate. And there's a lot more accurate about it that I I just don't have time to get into in, in this podcast. But as far as understanding criminal thought, but I just wonder how much of that was based on his interactions with the criminals in the House of the Dead. Oh, man, <laughs> you're asking these questions. Or rather in his prison time that he yeah, wrote I, about I in, the, in the House yeah, of the yeah, Dead. I Totally. Yeah. I'm just thinking, how much time do you have? <laughs> Six hours? You know, maybe we could do it. That that Russians do that. You know, they sit and they go, no, I'm not done. Let's start some more. I've read but, Russian novels. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. It takes a certain amount of stamina, you know, and patience. It, it pays off, though, doesn't it? Yes. It's good for you. It's good for you. Yeah. So, um, so crime and punishment, um, to my mind, see, here's the thing. As you mentioned, you get into the criminal psychology. You get inside the brain of of man. But this is not, this is not a, a man who is a violent criminal by by nature. I guess you could say it's someone who is has planned this crime very carefully, right? And so when you get inside his mind, it's not like a lot of let's say murders where you just get mad at someone and you kill him. You know, I I mean, I'm being primitive here. Those crimes of passion are crimes that in Dostoevsky's world are sort of, I would say more forgivable than the kind of crime that Raskolnikov commits because Raskolnikov's crime is absolutely planned out meticulously, as you know, right? He sits he plans, sits in his room and he, he spends months. How am I gonna do it? You're going, wow, <laughs> you know? So you're inside his head. And that's why I'm thinking that maybe there's a difference you know, between what he's doing in, in Raskolnikov's mind as he plans this crime, like an, he's an intellectual, really. He's overeducated is his problem. He really is. He's read too many books. And so he's creating a crime that he, he it's a kind of rationally thought out. Whereas mostly what Dostoevsky encounters in the House of the Dead, and I'm using I'm using that term, you know, the novel, but in the prison in Oms was was just criminals who committed crimes, you know, and he's not really inside their minds as much as he's observing them. So it's, it it's, it, as you know, because you've read the book and anybody who reads it knows that when you get to the moment of the crime, which comes very early in the novel. So it's, it's like a, a horrifying, ter horribly, just, just terrible visceral experience. You feel it happening. It's, it's a shocking, shocking literature, literary description of a crime. I, I every time I read it a lot, you know, because I teach it. And every time I read it, I go, oh my God, you know, I feel it again more than I feel in most things I read in literature. It's really shocking. Dostoevsky's a great writer and that he can do that to you and he doesn't hold back. But what's crazy about it, as you know, is he's doing it from inside the murderer's mind, right? He's not describing it from outside, really. He's he's like you're you're inside his mind through that whole time which was what was so unique about that novel when it was written. People just didn't do that, you know. They didn't write about murder from inside the, the man's mind. And so what you get is this crazy thing that goes on in your mind where you're actually kind of, I do this in my class. I'm giving away my secrets here. My students are going to listen, but <laughs> we kind of retell the plot. You know, we go, okay, Raskolnikov gets up and I go, okay, let's do it fortunately and unfortunately. So Raskolnikov, he's got this, he sleeps 
he sleeps in, right? He, he almost misses his opportunity to commit the crime. He wakes up. So then you go, oh my God, for, unfortunately, he slept too much. Fortunately, he got up in time. Unfortunately, he couldn't find the ax. Fortunately, he found the ax, right? And the different students, you know, contribute these different points. And ultimately you realize, wait, hold on. Fortunately, he found the ax, you know? And then you get to the murderer's house, the, the murder victim's house and you go, yes, fortunately she opened the door to him, you know? Unfortunately, she suspected him. Fortunately, he murdered her. You know, you're like, wait, what, what just happened here? You know, it turns out you're on the murderer's side. I don't think anyone does it better than Dostoevsky. It's crazy. And, and he gets you into that part of your mind where you're trying to sort out right and wrong and, the, you know, whatever's going on in those deeper levels of your brain that are sub-rational, you know. Yeah. Now, Raskolnikov, as he's planning it and he's asking himself, should I do this, that sort of thing, he's saying, well, great men, great leaders would have no problem doing this. They would Because he wanted some money and he said they would not think any anything of murdering this. I think she was a pawnbroker. Yeah. Of yeah. murdering this pawnbroker woman to get what they needed, you know, to... Mm -hmm. Basically, to fulfill their grand uh, design. See, I think he used Napoleon was one of the examples he used. Yeah, yeah. And it sounds to me like he anticipates Nietzsche's idea of beyond good and evil, that the, the Superman sort of can do whatever he wants. He's mm -hmm. not beholden to conventional morality. Mm -hmm. Is there an influence there from yeah. Dostoevsky on, New on Nietzsche? Yeah, definitely there is. And actually, Nietzsche read Notes from the House of the Dead, actually. It was one of the books really? that made it on him yeah what one of the thing i don't i don't i'm not russian you know but one of the things that comes up with these kinds of questions is like yeah nietzsche nietzsche was like dostoevsky but dostoevsky got there first you know a lot of these uh the the ideas that then entered western philosophy you know um they read dostoevsky or they read other writers who who really went deep and explored these problems so yeah um and, freud and loved dostoevsky you know and so on and Raskolnikov in, in the book, he meets, he falls in love with this a prostitute mm -hmm. and, you know, she's w with him. And then at the, you know, I don't, I don't want to give away too much, but I kind of have to for the sake of the discussion. He, he ends up, he, you know, finally he gets caught to, to his version of Javert uh, and ends up, you know, catches him and he, he gets sentenced to hard labor or he gets sentenced to, you know, Siberia. Which by by my lights, I mean, he committed a double murder and he's sentenced, I think, to, it was to 10 years and his wife gets to go with him. It's that worse. doesn't Seven yeah. years. It's yeah, worse. Seven, yeah. That doesn't sound like much to me. But it sounds to me within the forgiveness of, of, that, of the prostitute and ultimately through punishment in Raskolnikov gets redemption. He has the guilt, he has the punishment, he has the redemption. It seems like that's a theme uh, for Dostoevsky. Would that be accurate, that that punishment, redemption are, are themes yeah. that he likes to sort of push? Yeah. yeah, and it's important stuff, isn't it? I mean, it's not superficial. It's not like, I think, oh, no. do I have cake or ice cream? No, it's like redemption, you know, or eternal damnation. I mean, that's why we love Dostoevsky, right? But I think there's there's also um, you know common themes of, compared to what we were talking about with the Brothers Karamazov. With Brothers Karamazov is his last novel. It's like everything is sort of coalesced in there. Um, but the same theme of like earthly justice, you know, on the one hand, versus you know divine redemption and forgiveness and so on, um, is going on in in Crime and Punishment. So the title is Crime and Punishment, but the word itself. Um, you, you can also translate it in a sort of different way, um, you know, as the word crime in Russian also means transgress, literally, right? Which means so to like cross sin. Yeah, sort of. It's a little different from sin because, you know, it's an act, you know, and sin. You're transgressing, you're crossing the border of what what you're, I don't know, allowed to do. That's what the law would say. But yeah, sin, I guess. But is murder a sin? Uh, he, okay. yeah. <laughs> yeah that is a bad thing right it's a crime <laughs> but i'm thinking of my deadly sins and murder is not one of them oh you know? it, it, it's not one of the seven deadly uh, yeah exactly right so, church but it violates the ten commandments yeah the ten commandments right so it's it certainly is a violation of the of the ten commandments so but but i think what i'm what i'm trying to say which i love this kind of conversation because you're sort of like oh yeah but there's also here the legal crime 
that Raskolnikov ever met. No, it's against the logic of to murder people. Duh, you just don't do that, right? But then there's the deeper problem of, of transgression, you know, and that is more on the sort of divine level or divine, the, the, the problem where God is your, is going to judge you, let's say. And you early talked about, you know, morality, say, is rooted in an understanding that there's a life after life, right? That, that why, uh, and Ivan Karamazov talks about it, you know, why, if I don't have faith in the afterlife, why should I do anything that I don't want to do, right? I should might as well commit crimes, make a lot of money, you know, spend it and indulge myself if I don't believe in God and I don't think I'm going to get punished in any way. Um, in, in the Raskolnikov story, and you mentioned Sonia, which is very good um, to keep in mind, um, Raskolnikov gets judged by law and he gets sentenced to a pretty mild sentence, absolutely. Seven years, right? And then, and then yeah, Sonia goes with him. That's great. He gets his wife there and whatnot. So, um, but the law and the punishment he gets by law is, doesn't have to have an effect on him at all. You know, it's just like, oh, well, it's what the law made me do. Prison isn't very nice or anything, but, but the real issue is my immortal soul and prison can't touch that, you know. I've transgressed, and how am I going to get out of that? Prison is not going to solve that problem for me, right? So then Sonia comes out, and, uh, you know, the, I, I think it's okay to have a few plot spoilers, frankly, with Dostoevsky. It's not like some books that are, because look, he committed the murder in book one. There's six books, <laughs> right? Okay, he's, he killed her, right? No question about that. So we don't have to worry about plot spoilers, and the problem is how does he find redemption? Um, and the redemption, as you as you've sort of started talking, you know, comes to him through Sonia. So then, is it such a simple message of, okay, what you need is a good woman, you know? Is that the message of it? And Dostoevsky is not that primitive. Yes, you know, personally, I mean, I don't need a good woman. You know, I could use a good man, maybe, or something. But you know, that's a really good way to sort of make your life better, right? Is to find the right partner. It's very important. But in Dostoevsky. What happens is the way he describes her, she's a prostitute, right? He's a criminal. And Dostoevsky kind of puts him on that same level. You know, they both transgressed, right? But just them marrying each other is like, again, it's like a legal bond. Great. You go to the courtroom, you know, you get married. So what, right? You still have your immortal soul to deal with. So what Dostoevsky does through the novel is he says, well, she's a prostitute, but somehow she remains pure despite all that. How is that? And so he's looking at her soul now. And Raskolnikov needs that. And the other thing that Dostoevsky does, which is really quite beautiful, she doesn't, she's not too smart, which I think is hilarious. You know, she's, she, does, she can't read. You know, you remember that early on, this guy keeps trying to get her to read books and become in, in, intellectual and educated. She goes, oh, I couldn't get through it. You know, it was boring. You know, it's, it's like, it's not about her intellect at all. She's sort of quiet. She's loving, forgiving. She's not very distinct, you know, distinguished looking or super beautiful. It's all about her soul. And the way Dostoevsky presents her, and this is really important to how he communicates to you, um, is he presents her in the form of, if you, the Russian religion is based on a lot of, uh, there's a lot of icon veneration in Russia. So an icon is a religious picture, right? And a lot of times that's a mother of God let's say, or what we'd say the Virgin Mary, let's say, in Catholicism. So when Sonia is described in a couple of very important key moments, Dostoevsky describes her as in a way that you could, if you're, if you're reading carefully, you can see an icon of the Virgin Mary there behind her. It's super important because it's not verbal. She doesn't come in and say, I bless you. You know, it's just a vision that he has. And so if you recall the end, and we're giving away the plot, guys, so you can mute for a while if you need to. But at the end of the novel, then, he's in prison, Raskolnikov, and she's outside the prison. And she comes to him, and, and there's sort of a mystery why this happens. But you remember, she appears to him, and he falls weeping at her feet, you know, and is redeemed. You're going like, what just happened? You know, she doesn't say anything, really. She just appears to him, right? And she reaches out to him. And her pose in that image that, that Dostoevsky creates at the end is straight out of an icon, you know, so that a reader who's in that culture and knows what a Russian icon is, is going to go, oh, 
that's why he fell over and you know was redeemed it's because he he contacted the holy picture it's not purely about psychology so that's one of the ways that dostoevsky rises above the sort of legal level or even the psychological level to sort of suggest and hint at these messages that believe me none of us really know the truth right so if you, you said that we, we talked about Dostoevsky's influence on Nietzsche and you, you said that he influenced Freud what is his lasting influence both on literature and culture oh man like I said, we need more time. <laughs> Your readers are going, no, no, nope. <laughs> um, you know, it's really a, a super interesting to me because I'm I'm very embedded in, in Dostoevsky studies. And I was president of the International Dostoevsky Society and for four years ending in 20, uh, well, actually ending this year, the last year, 2023. So in that capacity, I met readers and scholars and worked with them from all around the world. And what just amazes me so much is how alive Dostoevsky is now with readers. You know, it's not like people go, oh, I don't want to read that stuff. You know, it's the 19th century. Who needs that? You know, I'd rather just do some tweeting or maybe watch some TV or whatever. I mean, people are still so profoundly moved by these novels because Dostoevsky goes very, very deep into our inner psychology and touches all those levels where we're sort of confused or bewildered about things and are seeking answers. He doesn't give you the answers, but he says, okay, this is what it feels like, right? And you go, well, I'm not an ax murderer necessarily, but I do feel troubled sometimes, you know? And he gets into that level of your inner psyche. And it doesn't change. People are people, no matter what century they live in or what country. So um, to me, it's extraordinary. Um, the Japanese, we had our symposium in Japan this, this August. And um, the, the person, my colleague there um, who hosted, Kameyama is his name, Kameyama Sensei, has translated Dostoevsky's novels into Japanese. And his brothers Karamazov sold a million copies. Not right? too shabby. I wish I That's could get a million cool. viewers. <laughs> you know, we, we have translations of Dostoevsky in, in, in America, let's say, that come out. It's in the thousands, you know, maybe. But yeah, a million copies. I mean, different cultures appreciate him to different degrees. Of course, he's huge in Russia now. And there are reasons for that, which, which also are related to Russian politics today, which can be a different conversation, maybe not such a, you know, a fun one to have. But the real essence of him, these questions of religion and philosophy, those are not going away. And he he grapples with them in a way that I haven't seen done by other writers. You know, Nietzsche, of course, is a philosopher, right? Philosophers do a good job with this, but they're not telling stories, you know, and they're not going inside your brain the way Dostoevsky does. I don't know what's inside your brain, but I'm saying he goes inside my brain. You know what I mean? No, he 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 he's masterful. Um, yeah. it, it, it's an experience. He's one of yeah. my, I'd say, top four authors. Yeah, um, it's a, it's incredible he, experience. He's great. Yeah. Okay, well, I normally ask if there's anything we we missed, but obviously, with somebody as fascinating as Dostoevsky, we missed a lot, and we could could talk all night. Yeah. So uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap it up there. I think we got it. Got the the meat of the, the subject, which is great. Uh -huh. So where can people find you? You mentioned that you had a, a blog. So where where can they get you? Yeah. Um. I don't know. Maybe I can do it in the chat. Is that something that they see? I don't know. They won't. They won't see okay. that. I'll just tell you. Um. One thing for Dostoevsky readers. Number one. Uh, it's not really about me. I mean, you could just Google my name and Dostoevsky and some stuff will come up, right? Which maybe is why you did. I don't know. <laughs> but <laughs> I didn't ask you about that. But a really great source for anybody interested in Dostoevsky is literally Dostoevsky.org. It's our website, the Dostoevsky Society website. It's International and North American Dostoevsky Society. It's an active site. There's a lot of stuff on there, great resources. So that's one thing I would say. In terms of my blog, um, my blog is called Chekhov's Footprints. That's C-H-E-K-H-O-V, Chekhov. He's another Russian writer and his footprints. And so in that blog is where I sort of follow these writers around and, and see what they're up to. Now, 
with COVID, I, I had to give up that project because I couldn't travel in Russia after 2019. So the latest posts from Russia are from 2019, but it was a considerable journey I spent in Siberia, 40 days in Siberia and whatnot. Wow. Uh, yeah, it was cool. It was super cool. After that, because of COVID, and then of course Russia invaded Ukraine, which got which was you know a nightmare. Um, I couldn't go back, and I, I probably never will. But um, I then turned my blog to writing about Russian writers' travels through other places, you know, mostly Western Europe. So those are the more recent posts. And I also have a a column in the Duke Student Newspaper, believe it or not. And that column is called Rants from the Podium. Uh, Rants from the podium. Yeah, that's my that's my that's my. I have one this morning, and I do mention Dostoevsky in these things. And I one a previous iteration of this column was actually called WWDD. What would Dostoevsky do? <laughs> <laughs> so that was from a few years ago. So if you're super curious about rants and what I'm ranting about, you can. I have one today uh, called. I forget what I called it. What's under the rock? You know, you lift a rock, and there's like slimy creatures under there so yeah yeah so um it's all just rants about literature basically okay thank well thank you so much for a fascinating discussion about a fascinating guy yeah thank you very much michael for including me and, oh it's it's been an absolute pleasure yeah. all right for now this is the rational ego is signing out i'm michael Leibowitz. remember i want your likes your dislikes your comments let me know what you think till next time